So a while back, uh, Marnie and Don uh, were talking about possible uh, presentations in for our Science Cafe. And uh, I mentioned that I happen to know someone who was into bird photography and uh, nature photography. And I said to her, well, I'll give him a call. And I have to say that I met Brian way back. I can't even, because of COVID, I can't remember. But before COVID, I think there was a, an event at Landon's Bay and I was doing some workshop for kids and they turned up for families and uh, uh, I met them and I had a delightful conversation with both Brian and Lana. And I was very impressed with their level of enthusiasm for nature and for uh, wildlife. And I said, well, um, you know, you might want to be get connected with some of the local groups. So Lana became part of our North Leeds birders. So I know um, Brian's partner very well to our birding expeditions all over this region. And uh, Brian is uh, uh, tags, tags along occasionally. And I know he's, his interest is not necessarily in identification and of birds, but in photography. And uh, I know that this is a, a, a passion of his. Uh, I've tried to do both. I've tried to do photography while I'm birding and birding while I'm doing photography and with limited success. So I really admire anyone who can uh, capture these fantastic images of these fast moving creatures and their very, uh, um, their habitats, which are not easy to, to, to do. So uh, I think it'd be great tips for people like me who would like to maybe get back into bird photography or into any kind of nature photography and uh, see how it's done. And so without any further ado, I think you would uh, join me in welcoming Brian Scholes to our Science Cafe for February. Thanks, Brian. Um, so yeah, first of all, thanks to uh, to your group to in, for inviting me, and I think Robert is well. He is one hundred percent correct. As I am not a birder, I I uh, I really enjoyed looking for them and taking photographs of them. But I'm more a visual person, and species identification is just not my thing. And I'm lucky to have Lana as my as my partner. There she is, right there. <laughs> I'll pop in for bird questions Be, because. Uh, she finds an awful lot of the birds that I have photographs of with her amazing ears and identification skills. And uh, I think without her, I would not be anywhere with, in terms of how much photography I have. Um, and as Robert was saying to the birding and bird photography to me are two distinct activities. I'm finding also that bird photography and hiking are two distinct activities. If you want good photographs, you've got to make that the focus. Ha <laughs> ha, good pun. And, uh, and take the time you can't just be keep moving and moving and moving if you want really good photographs at least I don't I can't maybe other people can but I I can't all right we are ready so I'm just going to start off with just a few bird pictures just to get a, a feel of of what we're going to be looking at So the photographs will be primarily from Eastern Ontario, and I've got a couple of others in there that uh, just because I didn't have good examples locally. Um, so. so my my plan is to <clears throat> show something about um, some bird photography and some aspects of it, and then talk a little bit about what's involved not going to talk too much technical about the cameras and stuff just in terms of what's involved as a as a human being trying to trying to make these kind of uh, recordings and then depending on the time uh, i was going to show some international i know that i know that a lot of uh, Lana's birding friends have international experience birding and so some of the international bird photographs i have might be of uh, might be of interest so that just depends on time and how far we get so that's sort of my three part uh, one is just to show some photographs and videos and then talk a bit about what's involved in doing it. And then if there's time, we'll uh, look at some other photographs. So we've seen a couple of photographs there of uh, recent photographs, uh, but it didn't start out that way. When I first got started, I bought a 70 to 200 millimeter lens and thought, okay, I'm gonna be a bird photographer and that's all I need. I had no idea that that was uh, hardly even the beginning. There's my very first photograph. And I thought, well, I'll just zoom in on it and it'll be great. Apparently not. <laughs> There's more, more to it than that. And then I tried 
uh, around the same place. It was probably 12 years ago. I thought, okay, well, let's try again. And no, oh, I still don't have it. This was these are my first few photographs. And uh, okay, in that picture somewhere you'll see a bald eagle. I don't know whether you can see the mouse or not. Uh, but no, I need to do some more work. So after many years' experience and better equipment, I was able to start getting the kind of photographs that I wanted. Um, so these are some of the examples of where I am now. And I actually am drawn more to video than I am to still photography uh, for a number of reasons. These are my first couple of videos taken in Nigeria. Um, and you can see that there's room for improvement. <laughs> so that's what I started with. And then again, with better equipment and more experience and more know-how and practice, I'm able to get these kinds of, uh, of videos now. So before we get too far into the how to do it, um, it's it's an interesting uh, interesting time. Uh, there's a there's a great quote by Melissa Gru that uh, basically it goes like there's never been a better time to be a bird photographer and never been a worse time to be a bird. Birds are being hounded for photographs and harassed, and people will go to un, unreal uh, uh, efforts to try and get the photograph. Outdoor, outdoor photography magazine has actually canceled any prizes for their photographs because uh, now you only get bragging rights because for a while people were doing all kinds of really unethical things to get the shot and I'm sure as birders I think there's a there's probably a bit of a friction between uh, some birders and bird photographers because birders are about seeing it and sometimes moving on um, and bird photographers are about doing whatever they have some some are to do whatever they have to get the photograph. And as a result, we're kind of getting a, uh, a bit of a bad reputation for disturbing the birds. Uh, I've, I've seen it, I've heard it, and I go out of my way to try and uh, not participate in that kind of activity. A lot of the really, really good owl photographs you see are they're baited with uh, people who have a mouse on a string and on a fishing line and they're pulling it in and the, and the owls are following it. And there's all kinds of uh, reasons as to why that is just not, it's not appropriate. Uh, it's so. So uh, there and there's a number of uh, of guidelines of codes of ethics. This is just one I put up here, um, but it's it, it's we like to say it's common sense, but uh, but apparently there's uh, people who want photographs uh, sort of cross the boundary. Um, so I'm not going to read all these, but you you get the idea is that you don't want to do anything. No no photograph is worth disturbing a bird, especially one that is that could then abandon the nest or endanger it. Um, there are just no photographs that are, that are worth that, that worth that aggravation. It, be, it requires more work to do it ethically and to do it safely, but I think that's what has to be done. So now let's continue again, or do I have to push play? No. So yeah, there are several of these codes of ethics uh, out there. So one of the ways to uh, to reduce the harm that you might cause is by having telephoto lens. So that's an example. This is the Osprey Nest in Landon Bay. So you can see on the back of my camera what I'm seeing. And that's that's a camera with a lens like this thing here. That's that camera, actually. Uh, so one way you can uh, bother the critters less is to stay farther away and have equipment that will let you, let you be closer optically, but not physically. So that's the kind of uh, zoom that, uh, that that that's a 600 millimeter lens. That, that's what the zoom that that has. So that's just looking at it closer up. Now the picture is, is much much better. I mean, obviously the picture is much much better than that. Here's another example of a red-shouldered hawk uh, sitting up on a nest. That uh, again, you, you just don't want to do anything that will make it make it fly away. Even if you want a picture of a bird in flight, that's not the way to get it. So, so why I have I have literally one hundred and seventy thousand photographs, <laughs> but they're not all unique. And but many of those are, are 
not worth keeping, but it takes too long to go through them all. So why do I take them? Um, well, part of it is I I just like the uh, the beauty of it, the the natural. Let me just make sure I have my. Uh, so yeah, so I'm, I'm a visual person, and I find just looking at them, and that's why I don't need to know the species to know that that it's uh, that it's beautiful. Um, so just the texture and the and the, the graphic forms, the shapes of the the different parts. This is a red winged blackbird uh, converted to black and white. I, I find that very appealing. I don't know why it's um, so. So these are the things that that draw me to uh, taking the photographs that I do. Um, so there's, there's there's the beauty involved. Um, that's just a star, not just as a, as a regular starling, but close up. And the colors are beautiful. Behavior interests me. There's a uh, this is a before and after. Mm -hmm. Just watching them nesting, working on their nests is, is a pleasure. And one thing that I was saying about video is you, when you watch the videos later, you notice all kinds of things that you're not seeing in the field. Here's a, an interesting uh, behavior that I only discovered by taking this video. This is on the outside of our house. And my daughter-in-law was concerned about changing diapers. I thought, well, watch this video. <laughs> it's, a, it's another way of doing it. <laughs> so watch it in slow motion if you didn't see it the first time. That's a different approach. But what it comes down to is uh, it's taking photographs that, that, that you want, that, that interest you. What do I do with them? I made I made this poster of uh, 65 birds in, when we were living in Nigeria that I sold a few copies. I make a calendar every year for family and friends, and I usually put the cover the cover is a bird. The insides are not uh, bird photographs, but the covers usually are. And there's often a photograph inside, uh, but it depends. I, yeah, I've made this little book that I am hoping to keep working on. This is the one that we might look at later. It has an, a whole lot of international uh, bird photographs in it. So photography is always a combination of content, uh, content, light, and composition. So with the right content, you're on a start as a peregrine falcon, a cormorant. If you get amazing light, then that even makes it uh, more interesting. <laughs> Again, light is uh, light is everything. It just it is, and bad light is just bad light. There's almost nothing you can do to better to make it better. Adding flash can make a difference, but uh, bad light is is just your enemy. Composition trying to find an interesting way to frame the uh, the bird. And I'm curious, I'm just interested, I guess, in the way in which uh, birds interact with our environment. So I'm often taking pictures of them with human uh, structures or things in the background. What kind of photographs are there? Well, you can take still photographs. You can take telephotos, so you can zoom in, you can pick, take a closer one. The last one shows the bird in its environment. Um, you can, I don't have any many macro because you can't get close enough with a macro lens for a bird to stay around. These are a couple of macros from uh, just of insects. But, uh, there's, the, there's our uh, deer fly that that's what it looks like close up. <laughs> um, video, I say, is uh, I, I just love taking video and I love watching it after. Uh, there's, you could do panoramas of where the of where the birds were taken, where the photographs were taken. There's uh, you can do three by three panoramas where it stitches nine photographs together. I have not uh, used any of this stuff yet, but uh, action cameras. I have a GoPro, and I have a uh, DJI DJI stabilizer that if I walk along, it will uh, it will smooth out the transition of your footsteps. But I haven't done that wish that much with that yet. Uh, What's involved? Well, you need the gear. Uh, the top right hand corner, I don't know whether my mouse shows or not, but the top right hand corner is what I've been using for a while. Uh, this is a microphone that cuts down the wind noise, which is a real problem when you're doing video. Uh, this is a full frame. This, can you, is, you can see my mouse. Can somebody nod their head if you 
So you can see where I'm pointing to sort of, yeah, okay. So this is a full frame camera. Uh, it doesn't have quite the reach as that one, even if you put that lens on it, it's not the same. This is the lens I started with, the 70 to 200. I thought, okay, well, I just ever, I only have used it at 200, so I'll just go ahead and get a 400, which is this one. Um, and even that wasn't enough uh, for what I was looking for. And then there's a macro lens, there's adapters. This little camera here, if anybody wanted to get started, this is probably $600. And that has more reach than this one up here. The zoom on this one is much greater. The quality is not the same as good, but if you're, I bought this to help uh, Lana with identification before she got her scope. So I can take pictures of birds that are a long way away and they're still actually quite good to, uh, to see um, a flash a remote and, and uh, a loop to put on the back of the, of the screen. Cause if it's bright out, you can't video, you can't see anything, it's too bright. And I have since, we, I since have just bought a new uh, mirrorless camera that I've had for, I shouldn't say this, but I've had it for three months and it's still in the box. <laughs> so um, that's my next, <laughs> my next project is I'm kind of waiting for birding, you know, birding season to start up a little bit. So that's the, that's the gear that I have. Um, the iPhones now take amazing photographs. The quality of iPhones in the right conditions is stunning. They obviously don't have a zoom, but you can often get close enough to things to uh, to take pretty sharp pictures. There's a skink. Uh, so, so sometimes you don't need to have, uh, especially if you want if you want uh, sort of scenery shots. An iPhone takes amazing photographs. And so I think the other ones do too as well. Uh, so once you have all that gear and go out shooting, it's still it's still difficult or tricky to remember it all. I was so, I was thinking a video of this, uh, of this Red Wing Blackbird, and I was so focused on it because the light was perfect and it was singing and it was doing its display. And I was just mesmerized by it. And I didn't even realize that it was out of focus. It had focused on the branch in front. And I should know better than that after all the hundreds of photographs, thousands of photographs I've taken. But I just got caught up in the moment, so it's it, I have to keep reminding myself of what I'm doing and paying attention. Um, so you have to have the right gear, you have to know how to use it, and I think a lot of people I don't know as much as I probably should. But the good thing now is with YouTube, you don't need to read the manual. There is a YouTube. Somebody explains. There's a couple of guys who are amazing. They explain every aspect of every camera out there. Um, so, so. Yeah, learning it is one thing, remembering it uh, and remembering to do it is another one. So before I go out, what's involved? Well, you got to think of what you're going to wear. And I don't know whether you can see. Can you see if I hold this up? Can you see this? Can you see that? I'm not sure. Yeah. So it's, it's a little book. Uh, it's actually full of a little uh, anecdote, but it's, the, the title is Good Birders Don't Wear White. So here I am not wearing weight. So that's typically, and I'm one of the few people around anymore carrying a tripod. Uh, it's bulky, but I'm so used to it, I don't mind. And for video, I there are very, very few handheld videos that, uh, that really are worth it. So I have the tripod with me all the time in the hopes of, uh, of video. And probably one of the simplest but most useful things I have is that vest. A vest with all those pockets uh, just allows you to have what you need without having things hanging over your neck all over the place. Uh, where to go? Well, luckily, again, I have Lana and she often knows where to go. Um, and scouting beforehand is a good idea, especially if you, if you can justify that time to just go for a walk without your camera gear, just to kind of look around and see where you might want to come back to. So this was, uh, we thought this, or Lana thought this was a uh, kingfisher, belted kingfisher net, uh, hole. There were a few of them there. And I went back several times, which is another aspect of it is you have to keep going back. Uh, and there are, there are challenges that go along with, uh, with bird photography. Birds in flight is a real challenge. This is <laughs> an attempt to get a picture of a, of a uh, turn. And so I took and took and took and shot and shot and shot and shot. And eventually, <laughs> that's the reality of it. That's what's involved. So almost 100 shots later, I got one. It's not great, but it's uh, it's certainly passable. 
And then I also got another one that's a little bit better light. Okay, so now with the new cameras, I haven't used the new camera that I have, but apparently it uh, has uh, autofocus on the eyes. So it will grab the eye and track the bird and stay in focus. It sounds too good to be true, but I've I've seen other people's results of it and they say it's amazing, but I haven't I haven't tried it yet, so I don't know. But so but that's sort of that's often what's involved in getting bird for fast moving birds, anyways. So here's another one. This one was interesting. Uh there's a harrier that was flying probably maybe 12 feet off the ground, but along a dirt road. So we did uh, it was there was nothing around, so I think we were safe. But so I was operating the uh, the gas, and La and I had my and I had the camera out the window, and Lana was steering, and I was trying to keep up with the Harrier, and she was trying to keep us on the road, and I just kept I kept shooting, um, and eventually I got that one, and I think I got another one as well. So so that it's it's luck. But it's also kind of knowing how to improve your luck and what to try. This one, most people that uh, like to do birds in flight take pictures of, of large birds because they're easier to find and not as, often not as fast moving. And uh, I thought, I'm going to try and see if I can get a picture of a little bird. And I found a house wren that was nesting and it was going back and forth and back and forth to the same the same places and it stopped in the same on the same branches and I thought I'm going to just stay here and, and just keep figuring out how to do this because it was too fast to focus so I tried all the techniques I knew and I stayed there for um that was for a couple of hours but I got that picture this is what was involved I, <laughs> it was 340 shots till finally I got the one that uh, because each time I looked at them, I could see where it was. This is another one of how sort of how fast it is. And this is another technique for birds in flight. Um, so, so I put it in slow motion. And the quality now is of the cameras is getting better and better. So you can take an individual frame from uh, from a little video uh, and get the one that you want. So this was one I took of a, of a swamp sparrow. Um, and then this one is right place, right time, and be ready. It, hummingbirds, as you know, they flit all over the place. And I, I just happened to be standing, watching something, and then it came, and it was they're there for whatever, a couple of seconds, and then they're gone. So that was, but part of that is is being ready. You never know what's going to happen. You never know what you see, and you don't have time often to react to it. You have to be ready all the time. And being ready for me now after making a lot of mistakes is taking some, taking a couple of shots before I leave the house to make sure that I have a card in the camera, that I have enough, that I have battery, that I have just to make sure that it's going to work. And now I no longer drive to where we're going with the, with the camera in the trunk or even on the back seat. I'll have it be between the seats uh, because when something happens, it happens fast. And you only get sometimes a few seconds before, uh, but uh, before before it takes off. And shooting from a, from a car is is good because the birds seem to be less less bothered by a car. As soon as you open the door, then that changes everything. Um, And then there's happy accidents. I oops, I didn't even know I had. Oops, yeah, I think it's. Yeah, I didn't even know I had these. I was taking the picture of a blue jay as it was standing on a branch. I didn't even know I had these in flight until I got home and put looked at them on the computer. I thought, whoa, and they're actually not bad photographs considering that I didn't even plan them. They they just happened. So. Uh, and to me, that's one of our most exotic birds, with the crest and the colors. I love it. Common but beautiful. Uh, taking video is an additional challenge. Here's uh, trying to shoot video with handheld. It's painful to watch. <laughs> 
And then once you find it and get to it, it's got to focus. And then you have to take a bunch of breaths and hold it and see if you can hold it still long enough to. So handheld video. There are probably people who have steadier hands than I have. Okay, so a tripod is better, but it's not necessarily the answer because here's what's involved. <laughs> you can't... You're on a tripod, and it's like, where'd it go? Where'd it go? You, it's it's got to be here somewhere. And then you find it, and now it's got to focus, and then it's gone again. So, yeah, this is so the tripod is a, is a part of the solution, but it's not it's not the be all and end all. You still have to <laughs> you still got to try and find the thing, and then yeah, focus on it. People are a challenge. Oops, there you go, walking in front of the camera. That happens. Finding it and then staying with it. And staying keeping in focus is another another challenge, even though it's on the tripod, it's the same same problem. And the camera wants to focus on things that are in its line of fire. Autofocus is an option. Um, but depending on the situation, the backlighting and so on, this is real time as it's trying to focus. It's taking its time. And then I decided to speed it up so you wouldn't have to watch it the whole time. And it took it more than a minute to finally focus, out of focus on this book. Once it found it, it was fine. But uh, so that's one of the challenges is focusing with the, from the car window is great, but it's, you're still breathing and the camera is still, so I'm balancing on the car window. I have since, eventually I got it. But it has to stay there long enough for you to, to but I did buy a clamp that I can use on the car window now so that will be uh, I have to lose enough photographs before I'll buy a new piece, new piece of equipment so I wanted a, I wanted a window clamp for a long time but I thought no I gotta lose I gotta lose some more photographs before I can justify it I've tried photographing from a canoe uh, shooting stills is not so bad uh, trying to shoot video even if you're perfectly still it uh, any little movement with video uh, is a problem. So, and again, with practice, patience, and the right gear, finally I get the kind of, and I have an, I have a microphone, like an ex external microphone. So that's sort of what I'm aiming towards with video of uh, just higher quality. Trying conditions, you have to be able to put up with some. Uh, some discomfort, maybe. <laughs> Not as much as the uh, the Osprey chicks, but uh, they're just out in the rain. But I'm out there with an umbrella, and I waited a long time to try and uh, get get this because it was lightning at the time, and I was trying to catch the lightning and the thunder. And uh, this one was shot in the dark, entirely in the dark, like I could not see the birds. I had a I had a tripod set up. This is in North Carolina. I had a tripod set up on these wood stork, and then it was just at dusk. And as the sun went down, I was still focused on them, and they didn't move anything. They didn't. They just stood there. So I just so I shot I think a thirty second exposure <clears throat> with them just standing there, and that was that's what uh, I, it, it's hard to. What I saw was black, <laughs> but the camera after 30 seconds of letting in the light that was there, it was able to, to uh, so the new tech, the, the new cameras are, they're, they're so good. Um, again, patience, you can see the same up Baltimore River nest up there. I think I stood, I don't know, over an hour there on that waiting for them to come back and they never did. If you look under the letters OR, you'll see, a, <laughs> this is in Costa Rica, you'll see a long green tail. Uh, so I, we stood there <clears throat> with several other people, uh, Lana and I were the only ones that stuck around until the uh, the big payoff. So we watched that tail and watched it and watched it. And eventually, five hours later of watching that tail, eventually uh, the bird turned around and came out. And they were, I guess they, but so yeah, so eventually, uh, wait and, yeah, so eventually I got that and that was worth the five hours of standing around. And apparently, I, I again, I'm not a biologist, I don't know, but the the male and female both uh, uh, sit on the on the eggs, and then they take turns. So then one goes away for a long time, and then another one, and eventually they come back. And the whole exchange takes uh, a minute, maybe. So that's your only that's your chance of getting something. 
So then one goes in, one goes out, and then it ticks off. So that's just an example of, uh, of what you can get if you're patient. Artistic shots, these are the kinds of images that I'm trying to get better at. This is one of my inspirations, this book um, by Russell Lewinard, and she breaks all of the normal rules of photography. It's grainy, oftentimes they're out of focus, but she's an artist first and photographer second, and it shows in her work. Her work is, is, uh, is displayed in, on walls all over, all over the world. So, and it's black and white. That's not what a bird photographer typically thinks of when they when they uh, go shooting for, uh, to me, this is, this is, this is art. This is magic to me. I love it. And then probably the gold standard of, uh, of bird photography are these guys. Edwin Scholes, there's no relation to me. These guys spent, I think, uh, maybe 13 years photoing all every bird of paradise in uh, Papua New Guinea, in Papua, Papua New Guinea. And the, uh, yeah, the, the photographs they have are stunning and what it took to get them is just this thing the work that they went to uh you'd have there's there's a couple of videos national geographic videos out about these guys uh, and watching the birds themselves the the uh the dancing rituals it's it's magic it's almost otherworldly when you see these things um displaying it's, it's crazy good so that's again these are my inspirations of uh of what i would like to try and get towards and i'm i'm slowly working my way there um, this was just a, a, a gull following us in uh, North Carolina. I thought, well, it's it kind of looks like Rosalie's work, and maybe I'll just give it a little blue hint and see what uh, see if, what that does to it. <clears throat> uh, this is again taken with a a long way off, uh, and because it's so far away and it's a low, it's one of my lower quality cameras. It gave it a really uh, grainy almost a almost a painterly look and that appeals to me I, I like that it's not what you would see you know on most bird photography websites but i i like that i'm trying to find interesting ways to compose them and these i just let through in because uh, i had them just playing with the camera and flowers to see what uh, frost these things interest me as well and they're all in they're all in uh, in the natural world. You often get unusual photographs and surprises. So only unusual in the sense that I have a lot of pictures of uh, red, red breasted gross beaks, but that's the only one I have like that. Uh, again, fanning the tail makes it a little bit different. I had never seen a great blue heron do that before. I've seen anhingas and other birds do it, but I'd never seen that before. I've seen it once since that time. I've only ever seen it twice. Um, and then weird little things like this <laughs> little duck pushing a tennis ball. And then surprises. I had no idea that had happened. I was uh, just shooting turns, Arctic turns at concert uh, Cataraqui. And when I got home, I thought, wow, look at this. And then I was looking at some other video. And, and uh, what I realized is that when they dive in the water and when they come up, the first thing they do is they flip over on their back and shake shake the water and then and then go upright but it happened so fast uh, i just happened that was a total lucky shot i had no idea that's what was going on um that stuff keeps me at it that, that stuff interests me this is again an example of video uh capturing things that you quite likely don't see at the time so in slow motion i never saw that other that other uh woodpecker come in at the same time So I'm back at home. What's uh, what's going on there? So this is my this is what I have in terms of uh, computer gear. And I do very, very little uh, alterations with Photoshop, um, cropping and maybe exposure color very, very rarely. And I would never add anything and I really take anything out. But I really like this photograph so much with the barbed wire, I couldn't, uh, I just, uh, so I got Photoshop and then took it out. So it's National Geographic would never allow that, um, but I'm not being paid by National Geographic. So I was fine with that. Uh, 
video, you've seen a couple examples already, but but video, it takes so many pictures so quickly, you have such a lot to choose from. And again, you see things in a video frame that you just don't capture watching the video at full frame. Uh, and here's um, the difference in quality. So this is a frame grab from a sort of, that was the 1920 by 1080 is the number of uh, pixels in both directions. That was sort of the quality, standard quality for a long time. And that has now been almost replaced by what they call 4K. So when you take a frame grab from a 4K photograph, um, the quality is, is, is stunning. So in terms of getting, yeah, in terms of getting uh, uh, more, more uh, frames to choose from and at higher quality, um, this is this has has appealed to me for sure, and it can be a fraction of a second that makes a difference. So that's that's as far as I had with that. Well, what's next? What's next is to open up, get my camera out of the box <laughs> for one thing, and start to use that, and to try and uh, try and do more. Um, just a second here. Let me just add a bunch of things I'd noted to you. So I'm 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 what what I would describe as a picture taker as opposed to a picture maker. And I so I see things, I take pictures of them. I need to become better at making pictures as opposed to taking pictures. And that means going somewhere, scouting something out, and trying to imagine where I need to be, what kind of lighting I want, what I expect to have happen just be much more proactive in making the picture as opposed to hoping that, because oftentimes in, when, I'm, when I'm with land out burning, I will stand where the light is good and hope that something comes. And often it actually does. <laughs> so, um, which surprises me and other people, but I've got some really good photographs and just, and I'm very patient and I just being, being there for me is almost good enough. Um, and when I go out, I really only want one keeper. I might take a thousand photographs, 400, 200, I don't know. I just want one. And it doesn't matter what it's of. I just want a good picture. Um, so, and I haven't done any of the sort of technical things like hidden cameras, like, you know, uh, camouflaging a camera, which is a lot of the birds of paradise people. That's what they've done. They've wrapped their cameras in leaves and put them up in trees and so on. Uh, I haven't done anything with, uh, with uh, night capture, trigger sense uh, um, cameras or underwater. Well, that, Burning wouldn't wouldn't apply it underwater, but um, so I definitely want more artsy photographs. Uh, I'm really happy to be doing what I'm doing for you people. I really want to get involved with more projects like yours and Winter Green and Kelly McGann, all the people who are trying to uh, preserve what we have and promote it with children. That's that's a that's a, an important part of uh, of it for me. Um, start examining birds more closely for the artistic qualities, like I showed you the picture of the starling, um, that that is just mesmerizing to me. I have a picture of a buffle head that happened to catch the sun and with its uh, rainbow neck uh, that, yeah, I want to try and get more of that stuff. Um, I don't think I need any more new gear. I've got my new camera um, and to continue doing these kinds of presentations uh, to make use of the photographs that I have. Uh, I and it, what I had following because I don't know how long, I didn't know how long this would take or what the level of interest would be whether we have questions. Uh, I was going to show a little video that I made of of Adobe Lightroom, which is without look without Lightroom, I would not be able to do what I do. When you take thousands of photographs, if you can't find them, you may as well not have them. Uh, so I I uh, I do a lot of what's called keywording. So I, I get the photograph and I. Uh, usually with well, always with Lana's help, she helps me identify it, so I can find all the all the uh, red-winged blackbirds I have taken here in Canada, I mean United States, wherever. Uh, in a second, it'll just boom, it'll find them all. It's a lot of time to get it set up, but it's not time that I. It's not work. I I really enjoy it. Um, so anyway, Adobe Lightroom is is a is a really important part of my uh, what they call workflow, uh, and it does simple editing as well cropping and so on. Um, so I don't know where we are. I was going to, uh, so I don't think this is worth showing you. It's a very technical, but if anybody ever wanted a tutorial, I'd be happy to do it with in person or Zoom. I've done it with somebody else one time. We did a Zoom, a Zoom lesson, I guess, just showing how I use it. 
Um, so, uh, it's, so the other part of the presentation I was I was hanging on to, not knowing where we'd be, is is pictures of uh, some international birds, and some of my efforts to create a book that is, uh, well, I'm just experimenting with sort of some, some RC stuff. Okay, so that's, you're seeing you're seeing the uh, the cover. Yes. Are you seeing a hummingbird? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. All right. So I, I'll just do a few, and then because it is eight o'clock, so. Um, so then I tried it in black and white just to see if uh, again I'm just experimenting with some with sort of some artistic ideas. Um, there's a resplendent Quetzal. Uh, oh, I forget this guy, Brazilian uh, uh, Siriema. Um, so something where the bird is not the main subject. It's just kind of we had a we had that hummingbird lay, have a nest right outside or almost outside our window. So I was able to kind of sneak a few pictures without disturbing it. And then it came out looking like that. Um, so, yeah, so these are the pages and these are the photographs that went to make the page. That's what I'm doing here. Uh, that's just about us. And this was in uh, Senegal. Ended up being at the bottom. And then I was experimenting with uh, just different kind of chapter headings this is what this is what i grabbed very lucky these things these macaws went over uh, and i was able to get one one or two shots of them all together so a, a nigeria a, a hawk a black kite i guess it is this one you've seen it started off black and white and then i just added some uh, different sort of color to it and some graininess to see how that would look I love I love flocks of birds. I don't know why. I just think they're so so majestic. Um, so this was an experiment with uh, just with, with color. This little finch in Brazil. So, and then I thought, what happens if you put three of them together? <laughs> and then I did a whole series of uh, of heads. So this is a peacock in India, a ruddy duck in Peru, um, a jay in Nicaragua. Uh, I think this guy's from Costa Rica, Puffin from Newfoundland, Kingfisher from Nicaragua, uh, Carmen Bee Eater from uh, from Nigeria, Guinea Fowl, I believe, from Senegal, and then a macaw from Brazil. And then I just kind of, I just find their heads are so fascinating. They're so different. For the same, I mean, they're all birds, but they, they certainly look different. And I like pictures of groups of birds. There's a bunch of Guajira cuckoos, some bee eaters in India. Uh, I, that one I found interesting is interspecial, interspecies. I don't know whether they're sort of discussing tactics on eating carrion, what they're doing, but I, this, I thought that was very interesting to see them so close to each other. And then I made one page out of them all. And then I went to try some black and whites. This is a cormorant in, in Senegal. Uh, I was just again just experimenting flamingos in France, black and white, and then uh, pelicans in uh, in Senegal. And then I did one on on feeding. So this is a cormorant in India that's uh, catching his lunch. Ended up looking like that. Uh, and then this is in Nigeria. Worms, lizards, snakes, butterflies, and then they ended up like that. Seeds in Costa Rica. This is at our. <laughs> we had a bird feeder, and I guess we're also feeding the raptors because this Merlin came along and got one of our uh, uh, one of our one of our uh, sparrows. <laughs> I made it into an ebook, so if you have the, this is a PowerPoint, but the book does have interactivity like this. Uh, again, I'm looking at colors uh, as in Brazil, some close up. So I decided to do a sequence of just eyes. Um, Kukal in Nigeria, again, the puffin. I mean, if you look at the eyes, they're all so different and they're all so interesting. The barbet, uh, I forget that guy's name from Brazil, and Hinga. A little Indian bird, a pigeon in Senegal, an owl, white snowy owl. That's all I ever got of that little guy. 
and then I just thought, let's just so, just let's uh, concentrate on the eyes and see what uh, what we get. Um, uh, this is Nigeria. And I'm looking just at interesting. No, there's no background to it, which I thought was kind of interesting. It's just a white sky. It's like it, it's like it's in a studio. The hornbill. This one I did. A, I did a little group on uh, on bills because the bills are as different as their eyes. Caracara. Oops. An egret. Yeah, I've forgotten the names of a lot of these guys. Hornbill from India. Uh, Peru. And then the uh, flamingo. And then I just kind of. So the so the book is just the, these are the pictures that went to make this page in the book. If you're wondering what it what it's about, so the ones that have the white boundary around the edge are the uh, is the book pages. So this was the original, and I thought, well, what if I cut out the background and see if that kind of just to see what it looks like. Um, and then I did a number of Canadian birds, Grosbeak, Peak, and uh, mallard. So these are the originals, and then that's uh, that will end up in the book. The wood duck, one of my favorite birds. It looks like it's designed by a person. I don't know. It's so cool. Um, and then I added, I had to demonstrate that I knew how to use um, uh, video. It's an interesting, interesting, interesting bird. Uh, Bell, uh, I forget what it's called. Well, I only have one, but then I so on the uh, on the ebook you can. You can click on that and uh, and then I made a map to show where they all came from. And I had to show how I could import a file, a text file. So I found all the scientific names of them all and, and imported that. And then I made uh, sort of a cast of characters is that yeah so they're all they're all there in the order that they appear in the book and that's maybe my favorite photograph of all time that is just such a fascinating and cool looking bird <laughs> frilled coquette from brazil it's beautiful he's beautiful that guy <laughs> so anyways and there's the end of it and i think and then just the, the back cover so thanks for indulging me to to uh <laughs> to whip my way through that book but there you go. Are you there? Anybody there? Yes. Okay. Yes. We are here. Thank you very much, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. Um, and oh, um, 